Thank you very much. I'm happy that so many people turned up. Um, I won't keep you standing for too long. Believe me, this is not more than 15, pay, 15 minutes long. So I'll be done sooner than you think. Um, in 2004, the United Nations General Assembly actually proclaimed 2004 the International Year to commemorate the struggle against slavery and, and its abolition. Since then, of course, there's been an upsurge in terms of national and international conferences and dialogue and exhibits about the transatlantic slave trade. While this is very, very important, and I'm happy that we're all gathered here to celebrate um, the 200th anniversary of the abolition of the Atlantic slave trade, it is also important for us to realize that even though that past is behind us, slavery itself is not behind us. So that particular historical moment is gone, but the fact of slavery continues. And I want us, as we commemorate the events of the 200th um, year of the abolition of the Atlantic slave trade, not to forget the fact that slavery is still here. So that's what my paper is really about. It was George Herbert Mead who once said in his scholarship on collective memory that the past is not final and irrevocable as we so often suppose. The past is always present. It is as hypothetical as the future. These are the words of George Herbert Mead. These are very daring words to utter in the arena of life where we believe so much in the bracketing of life into the past, the present, and the future. The very nature of our language has strained our psyche to confront reality in roped off categories. I am one who agrees with Mead that time is not as definable and finite as we make them. Time is fluid. Back in the 1960s, as a child growing up in Freetown, the capital city of Sierra Leone, I felt traumatized without knowing why. Looking back, there was no visible markers I could point to as to the cause of my everyday unease. It was as if just being in existence converted everything into a crisis. Maybe the nighttime stories adults chose to tell made my helpless estate too profound to ignore. The boogeyman was always just around the corner. Maybe it was just my sister, a few years older, whose insistence on telling me vividly painted creation stories about how stones used to be people, but God cursed them for their disobedience, made me so suspicious of even the beautiful landscape around me. One thing I know for sure was that having developed on a steady diet of existential violence, separation from my mother at age five was the most traumatic experience I can recall. Although my mother was not a single parent, she single-handedly raised us, me and my sister and two younger brothers, by herself for most of our lives because my father had chosen the pioneering life of an adventurer and was hopping from country to country in West Africa and abroad. My mother had to work, so she often handed me over to the neighbor's kids in grades six and seven to match me up to school. Sometimes my cousin, Ever, was handed over as well, and we would walk in front of the two girls, hand in hand, crying, as we thought of the unknown world beyond the safety of home. The poor older girls would try to comfort us but when that did not work, they would shut us up with threats. One afternoon, on our way back from school, they bought ice cream for my cousin Ever and me. We were immediately delighted and walked merrily along eating our ice cream. Suddenly, one of the girls said to us, eat up quickly because this is your last meal on earth. <laughs> I do not remember what happened to the rest of the ice cream, but I still remember Ever and I exchanging glances trembling with fear as we wondered what next would be done to us. We noticed that we were following an unfamiliar route and that the girls were certainly not pulling our legs. They stopped at a gated house to visit one of their uncles and we were ushered in. What were they going to do to us? I did not know, 
but I was certain they were going to sell us. What would the people who buy us do to us? I was traumatized beyond thought, and I remember sitting down in an armchair, feeling like lead in the living room. As unc an uncle appeared in a prison officer's uniform, at the time I thought he was, he was a policeman, and they said to him, uncle, we're here to sell these two kids because they never stop crying, especially that one pointing to me. They pulled me up out of the chair. The uncle, catching on to the game, turned to look at me and said, bring her here. I was terrified. I screamed, begging for my life. Please, I said, Papa, police, please don't eat me. Please don't eat me. This unsuspected, uh, this un unexpected cry from me had everyone rolling in laughter. It was their way of applying therapy to a situation they found unbearable, my constant crying for my mother. I say all this to paint a picture of 1960s Sierra Leone, a place where a child was wary of strangers because we had been told about possible kidnappings by certain men, mostly foreigners, who would sell us in some unknown country. Where I got the cannibalism part from, I do not now recall. Slavery, as such, was never talked about. Now, as an adult, I realize that the, that the word slavery itself and the, and the past Atlantic slave trade as a whole was not being talked about in Sierra Leone. It was at Penn State University, while I was teaching a book called The Middle Passage by Charles Johnson in 1993, that I got to know about the Amistad story, a story about 53 slaves who rebelled on a slave ship called La Amistad in 1839 in Cuban waters. In researching the story further, I was stunned to discover that the slave captives on that ship had been from Sierra Leone. How puzzling to grow up in a country with a slave history as Sierra Leone's and not hear of such a historic event. Why was the story not being told? How could we possibly know more about European history, about the French Revolution and the slumming of the Bastille, more than the history of notables in our own country? The Amistad story is unique because this is the only recorded incident where captured slaves actually revolted, got recaptured by Americans in their bid to escape, yet won their case that went all the way to the Supreme Court with the help of both black and white abolitionists, and at a time when slavery was still alive and well in the United States. In discovering why the Amistad captives rebelled in the first place, I was surprised to see the similarities between my hidden fear of cannibalism articulated at age five and the captive's fear of cannibalism on the slave ship in 1839. The leader of the revolt, Sembe Pierre, and other captives had inquired about their destination from the cook, Celestino. Celestino had pointed to a cask of beef and informed the captives that they were going to be cooked for dinner by their white owners, Jose Ruiz and Pedro Montes. Since Celestino was the cook, the captives had no reason to disbelieve him. He was, of course, joking, but the captured victims were so distressed that they decided to escape or die trying. Let me dig digress here to say that Steven Spielberg's movie, Amistad, never brought this very important motive for the rebellion into his movie version of the Amistad story. My book on the Amistad revolts, published in 2000 by the University of Georgia Press, however, recaptures the event of the revolt, the victories in the court trials, and, the more, imp and, and more important, an aspect not at all addressed by any other writers before me, what happened to the captives when they returned to Africa. So often, we think that the Amistad story ended with the Supreme Court verdict. In reality, the Amistad story in the Americas I discovered was only one chapter in a long story that has reverberations even today. In chapter five of my book, The Amistad Revolt, I talk about how the, the story of the Amistad Revolt was lost for more than 150 years in Sierra Leone how it resurfaced when an American anthropologist, Joseph Opala, taught a course called Sierra Leonean Heroes at the University of Sierra Leone and included Sembe Pierre, the hero of the Amistad Revolt, among them. The class was shocked as I was, as I had been, because they had not heard that story before throughout the, the school curriculum's offering from K through 12th grade. From there, one college student, Charlie Hafner, 
decided to write a play about the Amistad, which coincidentally was being performed at City Hall, when, given the volatile political situation at that time in Freetown, a military coup broke out. People emerged from the theater, overly excited by the event of the coup, took the prop of the slave ship off the stage and ran down the streets. And, not knowing the architects of the coup, attributed the successful toppling of a corrupt civilian regime to the efforts of this long-dead leader of the Amistad Revolt, Sembe Pierre. The victorious outcome of the Amistad story in the United States in the 19th century, the possibility of a refreshing change in the circumstances of their lives at the end of the 20th century, made such a giddy combination that the two e events became intertwined in the politics of the nation. You can, of course, get the rest of this exciting story when you buy my book, which is in the back. <laughs> George Herbert Mead's provocative claim that the past is as hypothetical as the future is made evident in the way the past came to life in 1992 during a major change in the pro political climate in Sierra Leone. Today, as we celebrate the 200th anniversary of the abolition of the uh, Atlantic State trade, it is easy to look across time and see a diminishing story whose effect on our lives is minimal. I hope that the story of the Amistad I have briefly recalled here will begin to tell us to take a second look at the past, because the past is very much our present. In the book, Slavery in the 20th Century, The Evolution of a Global Problem, Susan Myers, um, published in 2003 by The Division, Roman and Littlefield Publishers, were made plentifully aware of the iniquitous forms of servitude that have accompanied us into the 21st century. A plethora of exploitative practices have forced working groups associated with the United Nations, including the ILO, to recognize slavery in all its forms. Chattel slavery institutionally practiced in the 18th and 19th centuries had mostly vanished in the late 20th century. But anti-slavery watch groups came to re realize that not only, that, um, sorry, I'll take that again, but anti-slavery watch groups came to realize not only that vestiges of the practice remains in parts of Africa, as in Sudan, we all know about the lost boys of Sudan, for instance, and as in India with the Dalits, the untouchables, some of you probably know that, but new versions of slavery have developed over time that are pernicious precisely because they are not institutional. This invisibility of slavery fitting into what is called the second economy, or the underground economy, has created a vicious cycle that especially sustains organized crime around the world. Myers writes, and I quote, the anti-slavery campaign seems to be floundering as contemporary forms of slavery flourish in the face of increasing poverty, of disparities in the wealth of nations, of the great increase in the number of the world's children, as well as the proliferation of small wars and rebellions, end of quote. What we call contemporary slavery today includes but is not limited to debt bondage, child soldiers, as in the story here. As I, I brought a book that I'm still uh, almost finished with, Ishmael Beer. Some of you probably heard of him, A Long Way Gone, Memoirs of a Child of a Boy Soldier. And this happened in Sierra Leone recently with the war. Um, so um, she listed a list of the contemporary forms of slavery that exist today. And some of them, of course, debt bondage, child soldiers, sex slavery, forced prostitution, sex tourism, pornography, chattel slavery, sweatshops, we can go on and on and on. Much of the trafficking in such exploitative practices has been made, has been made easier by urbanization, migration, and especially by the proliferation of the internet. The internet has accelerated cross-border trafficking in human parts, a horrific practice where body parts like the kidneys are stolen from mostly people in poor countries and sold to vendors in rich countries who then access the medical terrain where body parts enter the general pool for distribution in the Western world. In China, for instance, government institutions themselves have carried out this practice by depriving prisoners of some vital organs that are then sold on the global marketplace. Kevin Bales, who wrote Disposable People, New Slavery in the Global Economy in 1999, published by the University of California Press, has defined slavery as, quote, the loss of free will, 
where a person is forced through violence or the threat of violence to give up the ability to sell freely his or her labor power. In this definition, slavery has three key dimensions, control by another person, the appropriation of labor power, and the use of threat of violence, end of quote. Although this is still considered as an unsatisfactory definition, it is one of the best working definitions we have so far of slavery. It is estimated that almost 30 million people today are caught in the throes of actual slavery. In Freetown, Sierra Leone, where I was born, the Amistad victory was, where the Amistad victory was finally celebrated in the 1990s, it is ironic to recall that it was at that same time that a civil war was brewing in the southeast of the country where rebel forces were strategically capturing the diamond mine fields, thus seriously disrupting the economy. Those of you who've watched Blood Diamond, you kind of have some sense of what the story is. Some of us might have heard the story of Ishmael Beer, you know, a child soldier um, whose life, of course, at age 12, had to become a soldier uh, in order to fight for his own survival. It, it is a horrific tale. The work is telling in its representation of the vulnerability of so many who find themselves caught up in the cycle of the new slavery, being victimized and perpetuating violence themselves. Those two narratives were circulating at the same time in Sierra Leone when I went to do research on the Amistad story in 1994 in Freetown. It seemed on the one hand that everyone had found out about the Amistad that was now popularized by the new military regime and it was being celebrated through many artistic forms. On the other hand, rumors about the war on the fringes of the southeastern border of the nation were getting to Freetown. Given the tides of refugees that were flooding the city, talking about the impossible things they had witnessed, we knew those rumors were more than rumors. They had to be true. Many braced for war. Sierra Leone then becomes an excellent example of how worlds collide, how narratives intersect, and how time conflates on itself. The new slavery, in this case, child soldiers and sex slaves, commonly known as rebel wives in Sierra Leone, that the civil war bred was intertwined with the narrative of the old slavery, the Atlantic slave trade, in the psyche of the nation. Last page. <laughs> what Grand Rapids Community College is offering throughout this exhibition is scholarship in action. A decision to actively participate in the conversation of how to continually democratize our world, to usher in social justice in diverse possible ways, and to involve the public in that conversation. Public scholarship is one of the best ways to engage the most people for the most good in the intellectual practice of humanizing the world. Indeed, the legacies of the past, its traces, its consequences, are all here with us today. We are the future of the seeds that were sown centuries ago. We forget that past at our own peril, for we know that history always repeats itself when we choose to forget. Our gathering today is symbolic, but it is also real. It is real because as we speak, slavery, what scholars have come to call contemporary slavery, is very much at home in our world all over. The narrative of slavery is not finished. It is just being told differently. This unfinished narrative, however, can be interrupted by the choices we make. It can be redirected, channeled into a healthy tapestry if we come to grips with it, learn from it, and rewrite the narrative so that the future we leave behind will be seeds of change, not seeds of impotence, seeds of life, not seeds of death, seeds of hope, not seeds of despair. I want to thank Grand Rapids Community College for sponsoring such a wonderful exhibition, for bringing the memory of our history's past into the community, and for creating opportunities for dialogue and exchange on the issue of living memory. These walls around us have offered a place for stories, and I hope that long after the milestone of the bicentennial has come and gone, 
the conversation on slavery will continue to impact the choices we make and the courses we support. Thank you.